All right. Well, I'm Ripley Sellers. Uh, welcome to Bob's Watches. Today we're talking about and taking a first look at the brand new Omega Speedmaster chronoscope that was just announced today. Now, the Speedmaster itself is a watch that really needs no introduction. Um, it's one of the four main collections that comprises Omega's catalog alongside the Seamaster, the Constellation, and the DeVille. Now, the Speedmaster itself, it's Omega's dedicated line of chronograph watches. It first came out in 1957 as a watch specifically intended for automotive racing, hence the Speedmaster name. Um, however, soon after that, it was picked up by astronauts, became the official watch of NASA, and in 1969 became the first watch worn on the moon. And since that point in time, it's pretty much been known as the moon watch. The watch of NASA has been certified by the ESA in the form of the X33. And even though Omega makes the various racing editions, which are you know, uh, automotive racing inspired versions of the Speedmaster, they still largely follow that same sports watch format that was first unveiled in 57. So today marks a new chapter in the Speedmaster's history, its legacy, and it's an interesting one because while it moves the collection forward, it also does so by looking to the past. And when I say the past, I don't mean the Speedmaster's past, I mean Omega's past, its chronograph history. So the new Omega Chronoscope, which, and uh, by the way, guys, if you're greeting us here from either TikTok or Instagram, head on over to YouTube where we're going to have the full video and you can see the composite image where we're showing the photos of the new watches. Otherwise, you're just looking at my face and well, that's fantastic. The watches are even better. So be sure to head over to YouTube and check us there. But anyway, back to the Chronoscope. What the Chronoscope is, is it is a Speedmaster. And if you can see here, here's one of the variations. It's a Speedmaster. It has a chronograph functionality. It largely follows the design of the current ones, the uh, coaxial versions, um, like the automatic ones, like the one I'm wearing today with the bi-compacts layout. Except this one, it's not an automatic. It is a manual wind, but we'll get into all of its movement specs later. Let's first start at the dial. What is it and why, why is it not a Speedmaster yet? Why is it a Speedmaster? It's a Speedmaster because it's a chronograph and because Omega wants to call it that and because it has its, its external tachymeter bezel, which has defined the collection since it first launched in 57. However, if you look to the center of the dial, you'll notice that quite a bit is different and it's something you might have seen before, that highly involved sort of um, snail spiral scale. Um, sometimes you see it listed as a scientific scale. What it is is it's three different scales. It's a tachymeter, it's a telemeter, and it's a pulsometer. We're going to get into all that functionality shortly. But what these, it's a unique feature set that you see in old Omega chronographs from the 1930s and 40s. Um, it doesn't necessarily look like this watch, but it has that same really, really busy dial with the Arabics behind it. Now, that model from the 1940s uh, served as the design inspiration for this watch, but this watch isn't a vintage-inspired reissue or a heritage or anything like that. It's taking that same idea and then moving it forward with the Speedmaster's DNA in an entirely modern direction. So what does all of this do? There's a ton of different numbers and words on the dial. What is all of this? So let's zoom in here. You can kind of see um, there's a lot of things even overlapping. Zooming out a little bit, you can see, just like the Speedmaster I'm wearing, you've got hours and minutes in the second in the center, along with the chronograph seconds hand. Running seconds for the time is at the 9 o'clock position. And then at the 3 o'clock, you've got... Uh, a stacked chronograph register that measures both the hours and minutes. So there's actually two hands on that one. Outside, you have the standard tachymeter bezel. You'll find that on standard Speedmasters like the one I'm wearing here. It's used for measuring average distance, uh, or average speed rather, given a known distance. Um, and then on the innermost scale here, which you can see uh, right along the periphery of the number of the Omega logo in the center, that's a continuation of the tachymeter scale, but for um, speeds lower than 60 miles an hour. So um, the Speedmaster being a watch for racing, it really is more geared for automotive racing. So it's bezels for the faster side of things. This still retains all that functionality, but if you're not racing, it'll also let you track a nice 25 mile an hour coast. Now moving back out along that side a bit to the center section of the dial, um, you'll see the words telemeter, right? under the Arabic numerals. What that is used for is for measuring the distance of an event from the observer given um, both a visual and auditory ob uh, observation of the event. So the classic example used is lightning. You see the lightning strike and then you hear the sound of thunder. By using the telemeter scale, you can figure out how far away that is. You start the chronograph when you see the lightning, you stop it when you hear the thunder and it's graduated uh, and it uses the speed of sound which is a known figure to calculate its distance in kilometers. Um, 
not all that useful in our modern li day lives, but back in the old days with war and artillery shells launching and all of that, it did have a really practical purpose. Moving inward again, so between the telemeter and the um, internal tachymeter pulse. So long before Apple watches and smart watches and digital devices, and other good stuff that take our, our pulse automatically and calculate all that, doctors use standard watches and more specialized versions of these that came in the later years of the tool watch um, were those that had a pulsation scale. This one's graduated for 30 beats. So simply you start the chronograph, count 30 beats, stop it once you've counted those 30 heartbeats, and then read the pulse against the scale on the bezel. So there's a ton of functionality here. It's one watch that kind of measures it all. Um, it's, as far as its dimensions, it's 43 millimeters in across, just like this, but it's only 12.8 millimeters thick. So it's quite a bit thinner than this one. And that's largely because it's a hand wind movement rather than an automatic. So you don't have the rotor, you don't have that upper bridge with the automatic works. It's a bit thinner. And given that it's the same width, um, it gives it a much kind of flatter overall appearance and it should wear really nicely on the wrist, although we haven't seen one today. Now, so it, at the present time, you get it in either stainless steel or Omega's bronze gold alloy, which is something that only Omega does. It's, um, it could be considered a nine carat gold. It's 37.5% gold. They also mix in palladium, platinum, and a bunch of other elements to make it uh, cor corrosion resistant, yet still retain that kind of warm, kind of bronzy hue. Um, again, only something Omega does. So it's just their special blend of, of, of nine carat gold. So they've got one version in nine carat. It looks like this. It features a brown ceramic bezel insert, um, a bronzed oxide dial. So it's a bronze dial that they've aged with that kind of deep brown effect, similar to how they've done on the No Time to Die Speedmaster. Um, and then of course you've got the bronze gold case. This version is only available on a brown leather strap and fitted with a brown, uh, you know, a bronze gold buckle. Let's see if we can show it off right there. There you go. And as you can see that dial right there, it's, uh, it features those kind of concentric circles around the Arabic numerals. Um, kind of slopes down at the end. So it's very vintage inspired despite it being a modern watch. Um, both watches, the steel one and the bronze gold one are powered by the same movement, the caliber 9908. So there isn't a like fancy version like you get with the gold versions of um, some of Omega's other watches, but we'll get into the movement again more later. As far as the steel versions, what you get are six models, um, which consists style variations and the option of either a matching steel bracelet or a leather strap. So you get this one, uh, which I hope you can see me again, head over to YouTube if you're watching us on either Instagram or TikTok, so you can actually see the watches I'm talking about here. But you have this one, which uh, features a silvery dial with uh, blued numerals, blued hands, and a blue aluminum bezel insert. So on the stainless steel ones, they're um, aluminum, not ceramic. Uh, the ceramic bezel is only on the uh, bronze gold one. You have a blue dial with um, silvered numerals, silvered hands, again, a blue aluminum insert. And you also have this silver dial with an interesting you know, black registers with red accents, and then this unique kind of red and striped uh, chronograph second hand. It's kind of an interesting take on a panda dial, uh, also really cool. And again, these come on steel bracelets, or you can get them on leather straps uh, you know, in either blue, brown, or black, depending on which one you get. Again, bronze gold one doesn't come with a bronze gold bracelet. It uh, just comes on a brown leather strap. So I guess let's get into the movement. Um, the movement is a new one for Omega. It's the caliber 9908, which is based on like the 9300 and the 9900, which are the automatic ones that power these watches. Um, so what does that mean? It's uh, Meta certified. It's a master chronometer. So it's completely anti-magnetic up to more than 15,000 Gauss. Um, it's going to run at minus zero to plus five seconds a day and has passed all of the stringent testing of Metis. Um, on top of that, what it also does is it retains the jumping hour functionality of this one where, I don't know if you can see it here, but if you pull the crown out to the first position, like you would to set the, um, like the date on a watch instead of the time, you can jump the hour hand forwards or backwards in one hour increments. And this retains that functionality. So it's really useful if you're traveling. This one's able to do all of that as well. Uh, gives you about a 60 hour power reserve. And again, it's manually wound. So if you check it out here, the photo of the movement itself, you can see that um, it's got Omega's typical kind of Geneva stripes decoration, but rather than radiating out from the center, like virtually all of their other movements, this one radiates out from the balance wheel. Um, often the balance is considered the heart of the movement. It's the regulatory organ that's responsible for the timekeeping of the watch, 
On this particular one, it's made out of silicon and it's a column wheeled controlled chronograph, so you get all those goodies as well. But if you notice in the picture here, and let me go to this closer up movement, you can see the engraving branching out from that center jewel, that's the pivot of the balance wheel. And this is a first for Omega. Um, generally, it branches out from the center uh, beneath the axle. I don't know if you can even see it on this one I'm wearing here, but it um, it's, creates a much more radial finish versus kind of a bursting finish. And so this is really unique in that regard too, and really kind of um, makes the most of that rather closed movement architecture where most of what you're seeing through that open case back is one very large upper plate. This, it's decorated nicely and of course gives you the obligatory master coaxial branding on it. And again, because um, this is a bronze gold model, not an 18 karat version, the balance bridge is uh, it matches the watch. It's not made out of Sedna gold like you'll find on some of the solid gold models. Um, all in all, this is a really, really cool piece. Uh, it marks an entirely new chapter in the Speedmaster's history. It's no longer just the sports watch or just this watch for space exploration. Um, it's looking forward in the Speedmaster's direction, looking what else can it be, a watch more made for a wide variety of applications, be it in the scientific community or even just someone on vacation, bored on a road trip who wants to measure their average speed over a known mile distance. Um, but at the same time, while looking ahead and progressing the Speedmaster's history and its scope and what the collection is to people, it also ties the Speedmaster, which is Omega's most iconic, most famous watch, let alone most famous chronograph, to the older chronographs that predate the Speedmaster's history. So this is kind of like the missing link model. It's a modern watch, you've got sapphire crystals, meta certified master coaxial movement, but it largely follows um, an aesthetic that was first pioneered in the 1930s and 40s. So it's a really cool watch, we're really excited. Again, it was just announced this morning, so we haven't had a chance to see it yet. Um, but obviously, as soon as we do, we're you guys are gonna be the first um, that we're going to show it both video and I'm sure we'll put an article together at the very least. Um, but at this point, you know, we want to open it up and see if any of you guys have any questions and um, just, you know, see what we can answer about it and uh, have a bit of a discussion about probably the most um, different or most uh, groundbreaking Omega Speedmaster to come along as far as changing its um, standard design DNA. Okay, so. How much will these cost? Excellent question. So at the present time, uh, it is $8,300 for the steel models, any of the three dial colors on the leather straps. That price jumps up to $8,650 should you want one of the models on the um, stainless steel bracelet. And a note about the stainless steel bracelet, it's uh, 21 millimeters at the lugs, tapers down to 16 at the clasp. And unlike the, um, the clasp that's on the current production, classic moon watch. This one actually features a really convenient extension system, so you can kind of open it up about a half length, completely tool free. And I believe we even have a photo of that in here. Yeah, there you go. So um, you can see there's a simple push button and it'll let you just pull it out a bit. Uh, so it, it's quite a nice bracelet and it's only $350 above that. Now, if you want the bronze gold one, that's where things go quite a bit up. So $8,300 for steel on leather, $8,650 on steel. And if you want the bronze gold one, it's $14,100. But again, it's a nine karat gold case. Um, you get a ceramic bezel. So there is some added value there. And again, bronze gold is kind of an Omega exclusive thing. So if you like the idea of bronze gold, um, this is only the second watch to feature it. The first was the Seamaster 300 that they released earlier in the year. Um, so this is, it's a very novel material and, uh, it's, you know, again, the only the second watch made with it. So 14,100, um, now which one do I like? So I like bronze gold, but it's not my favorite. I think bronze gold is a really cool alloy. It'll be interesting to see how they age. Um, but in terms of my favorites, my favorite's the one that, with the silvery dial and the blued hands, the blued numerals and the blued track, the one that I'm pulling up right here, this one, um, I think its dial is prettiest. I love a good set of blued hands. Um, I wouldn't get it on the blue strap. For me, I would definitely drop that extra 350 up front and get it on the bracelet. I think the new Speedmaster bracelets are fantastic. Um, I think the Panda one is really cool as well. Uh, the Probably the coolest feature about this for me is going to zoom in right here. You can see the chronograph seconds hand, the centrally mounted one, alternates red and white stripes, kind of that like barber pole style. I think it's really cool, but I don't think I could actually pull this one off as my everyday watch. So for me, my favorite will be uh, this guy right here, the, um, the blue and the silver dial with the blue one.
Um, is Omega better than Rolex? <laughs> well, this is probably a topic for an entirely different live stream and one where I've got more coffee, but it really depends by what you mean by better. Um, better is kind of one of those words that's entirely subjective. Uh, you know, what do you mean by better? There's certain things when you're mixing apples to apples, one might be better, but better for who? Um, you know, two watches that are identical and the only difference being the size, one might be better for one person simply because of their preferences or even wrist size. I've got small wrists, so um, I, you know, I generally wear smaller watches, but is a larger version of one possibly technically better? Sure. So now, is Omega better than Rolex? From an investment potential, from a bang for buck potential, from an availability at a retail level potential, all those will have different answers. Um, what I can tell you, in my personal opinion, Omega offers a ton of bang for your buck and without a lot of drama as far as buying one. Um, we all know it's impossible to go into the store and buy a stainless steel Rolex, um, and that's not true for an Omega. You can go in and buy a Seamaster, your choice of colors, most days of the week. They also retain their value quite well, um, but there's no Omega that you're buying. You're not buying a Seamaster today and turning around and flipping it for three times its retail price the next day. So as a quick investment, not better than Rolex, but is if you want a high-performing dive watch or chronograph, this is a fantastic, fantastic proposition for the money. So um, a Daytona costs about, you know, if you assume you can get one at retail, about as much as the bronze gold version, a little bit less. And, um, you know, significantly more than the steel models. So bang for your buck, Omega offers a lot for your money. Investment potential, it's Rolex, but really these are all some of the best watches money can buy and they have very, very different aesthetics. What Omega puts forward versus what o Rolex puts forward are really kind of apples and oranges. And at the heart of it, it has to you have to decide which one fits your budget better, but more importantly, which one do you like better? The person who's after Speedmaster might not be the same person who wants a Daytona. And if you want a Submariner, and, own, and are dead set on a Submariner, a Seamaster might not scratch that itch. At about $8,000 and change for a manually wound stainless steel chronograph with meta certification and more scales than you know what to do with, that is a tremendous value for the money, and you'll likely be able to purchase these at any Omega boutique without a multi-year waiting list. So th that's always something to consider. Um, I'm sure we're probably going to have a Rolex versus Omega debate video coming up, so I will save all of my current thoughts and else for uh, for that one in the future, but that is an entirely different can of worms. Um, will Bob's get one in soon? Probably. Probably. One of the great things about us is we're not a retailer for brands. Um, we get models and we buy most of our watches directly from the public. What that means is we get often the hottest models sooner than anyone else because that those are the ones that people you know, want to see, want to buy, want to sell. So as soon as these start re making their way into the public, uh, keep in mind it was just annou announced a matter of hours ago, but as soon as they keep coming out into the public, um, I'm going to bet that we'll have them in before most people. Um, we've had all of the new Rolex models already, including all of the OPs and all the different sizes, all the new subs, all the new explorers. So I imagine this will be very similar and you'll be seeing them on our site uh, before too long. Now, as far as which dial color metal variant you'll, we'll get first, that is anyone's guess, but um, will we get them soon? Yes, I can almost guarantee that. Um, let's see, any other questions here? Okay, I've got one more. One other important thing to note about these Speedmasters while this other question is coming in, the uh, classic Speedmasters have um, this kind of pencil-ish style of handset. Not sure if you can see it here all that clearly. The ones in uh, the new, um, these new chronoscopes have kind of leaf-shaped hands. So it's, again, leaning in that vintage-inspired direction. And they're non-luminous as well. So again, this isn't as, although it has more functionality than the standard Speedmaster, it isn't as sports watch or tool watchy as its counterparts. Um, okay, do you expect these Omegas to still, uh, okay, do you think that these will be, um, available at retail or will the, the, the my, the handwriting on this, you guys, okay, <laughs> do you expect that these Omegas to sell, ah, to sell over retail at the aftermarket, or do you think pre-owned will be available in a few months at a discount? Honestly, without a crystal ball, there's no way of knowing. Um, 
I imagine these will be hot watches for a short while. Who knows how things are going to go moving forward. But these are some of the most noteworthy new Speedmaster editions. And maybe not no most noteworthy, but most different. Um, you know, obviously the new current production coaxial moon watch was huge news. Um, the, the revival of the caliber 321, also huge news, and you still can't get that one at a retail level, but that has to do with Omega's production. The caliber 321 is done in a dedicated facility. Um, the whole watch is assembled by a single watchmaker. Their production on the 321 is kind of fixed. Same with the, the, the new Snoopy. This, um, as far as I can tell, they won't have those same type of production constraints. However, um, this is a really cool watch. And for a Speedmaster collector, someone who has numerous different Speedmasters, they have the classic Moon Watch, they have one of the automatic ones. Um, this is an amazing addition that you can add to your Speedmaster collection, and it's a totally different watch. You've got a hand-wound coaxial movement, it's a sapphire crystal, you got these Arabic numerals, you got the scientific scale in the middle. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if these were trading, you know, slightly above market initially. Who knows if that'll persist, but um, as always, check a, take a look at our website because it will be up to date with the most up-to-date pricing and availability. Well, oh, one more. Yeah, are there any Omegas selling for uh, above and over retail? Yeah, absolutely. It's basically the ones that you can't get at retail. That's what dictates whether or not something sells above retail. Um, if you could go get a Rolex at retail, a steel Daytona for 13000 and change, they wouldn't sell for north of forty grand on the pre-owned market. So for Omega, it's the ones where there is that hard production cap. They have a lot more flexibility being part of Swatch Corp than Rolex does as an independent. But even still, there's certain things like I just mentioned, the Caliber 321. Omega, when they set that up, they set up a whole new facility at their headquarters to basically do those 321 watches. That new Ed White Speedmaster with the 321 movement, it's not just the movement that is uh, done to a higher level. That whole watch is assembled by one watchmaker. Uh, similarly, that Snoopy, um, they're not going to make that a huge percentage of their of their catalog. And so that watch has waiting lists that are even longer than the Day Rolex Daytona at some retailers because it's simply a hot watch and they can only produce so many of them due to that animation on the case back. So those are probably the two that are selling above the most. Um, there's other, plenty of others that are limited edition Omegas that aren't available at a retail level that are selling for well above their retail prices. Um, you know, the James Bond Spectre is a good example of it. That was a limited edition. Those things are all selling for, you know, north of 10K these days, basically. Um, so, yeah, there are certain Omegas, but it's going to be the ones that you can't find. All right. Um, do you think that Omega is probably responsible for damaging its reputation by introducing a multitude of watches every other month? So, I don't know. It, it's hard. I have, you know, I think for the enthusiast, it can be a bit, it can, you know, be a bit of a turnoff to have there be just so many new watches, so many limited editions, kind of always that possibility of having a, a different one or something you like better come along or just losing the specialness with so many variations and limited versions. Um, but as far as damaging their reputation, I don't really, I don't know. I, I, I like to joke about Omega's limited editions and the numerous, uh, just the extent of their catalog, how they'll launch a new constellation model and then offer it to you in 50 something different ways. I like to joke about that, but at the same time, more choices is better, uh, especially when you're able to get the one you want. And so um, I think this is a welcome addition to the Speedmaster catalog. I don't necessarily love all of Omega's limited editions. And on some, I think they're kind of downright reaching for a connection for or for a new model to introduce. But I think at the end of the day, it gives us something to talk about. No one makes you buy any all of the watches or any of the watches. And But I do like seeing throughout the year countless things get introduced by them. And um, there is a little bit of something for everyone, whether you want a very, very modern, no compromises sports watch or something really, really vintage inspired or simple and classic, tiny and gem set. They literally have something for everything and probably 18 different versions of it in four different sizes, five different medals and 35 different colors. So on one hand, yeah, I think there is some merit in Rolex's approach of we're going to roll out a new model every 20 years, offer it to you in black or white and deal with it. Um, there's some consistency there and a Submariner today is immediately identifiable as any Submariner has been since the 50s. With Omega, their design DNA is a bit more loose, it's a bit more flexible, and um, it lets them have a bit of fun as a brand. A lot of the limited editions that they release, like the Bond versions, um, you can't really see Rolex doing that. But for Bond enthusiasts, 
hardcore Omega collectors who like the diversity, movie fans who aren't even watch people but like that, um, sailing enthusiasts, all those various limited editions, special editions, commemorative pieces, they kind of add something for everyone. And at the end of the day, even if they're not for me, I'm kind of glad they exist in the first place. So that's a pretty long answer of saying yes, maybe to some, but I'm glad they're still there regardless. Um, guess we're running short on time. I think that's the majority of the questions. If you have any other questions, you can head over to our blog. Feel free to drop it into the comments there. One of us will definitely answer to it. Also, feel free to ask it on social. We'll definitely be there. Um, we're going to be excited to see these new watches come in in the metal. So as soon as you're they're here, expect to see them on a watch talk, an unboxing or something. Um, but for now, a uh, quick overview of the images. And uh, that's where we'll have to leave you with until we get one in hand. Again, I'm Ripley. Thanks for watching and have a great rest of your day.